Welcome to the Futurati Podcast. Any member of the Futurati is somebody who believes in the power of the future. We know there's a better world ahead, and we indeed have the power to make it so. In our podcast, we talk to the best minds in the world about the most urgent problems facing mankind today, and we hope you learn as much from them as we do. I'm Thomas Fry, a professional futurist and keynote speaker. And I'm Trent Fowler, a machine learning engineer and author. Thank you for joining us. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for listening to the Futurati Podcast, where we dive into how emerging technologies will impact the world and your bank account. From Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk to Vitalik Buterin and the unknown Satoshi Nakamoto, some of the most influential and impactful people in the world are the founders of startups. These people have the courage and vision to embark upon uncertain ventures which permanently change the world. But though much is written about how they approach business or stay productive, much less time is spent on understanding how they function psychologically. Tonight's guest is among the leading experts in the world in just this subject. Gina Gorland decided to pursue psychology after realizing that her ambition in life was to discover how to enable people to achieve greatness in theirs. Today, she is a professor and licensed psychologist in New York City, where she unites art, science, philosophy, teaching, and practice in the common aim of helping people become their noblest, most sublimely joyful selves. If you enjoy this interview, please subscribe to the podcast and share it with your friends. And don't forget to check out our website, futuratipodcast.com. Gina, thanks so much for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Let's hear a little bit about your background, your interests, and what brought you to working on the problems you're working on today. Sure. So my background is in clinical psychology primarily. So I have a PhD in clinical psychology. I did internship residency, postdoc, got a a tenure track faculty position in New York as a clinical psychology researcher, teacher, supervisor, and then, you know, practitioner, licensed psychologist. But I've also always had an interest in philosophy and the good life, and particularly in fellow kind of oddball, ambitious, kind of follow their own path, live outside the mainstream kinds of people um, who I've both always personally resonated with, but also just have found to be fascinating challenges in terms of, well, how do we optimize for this person's very idiosyncratic set of interests and values? And how do we help them chart their own path in a way that will be really satisfying and how do we use these standard tools that we've learned through clinical psychological science to address these very non-standard and very you know entrepreneurial problems and opportunities that the, these individuals are undertaking and so that's brought me to the work I'm currently doing which really applies the synthesis of philosophy and clinical psychological science to the challenges of founders entrepreneurs ambitious people I love that. And I want to talk more about that project, Building the Builders. But I'm just curious, methodologically, if if it's the case that these bright and ambitious you know, world changers are so idiosyncratic, what hope do we have of identifying consistent principles that will help all of them or most of them? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think we have lots of hope because, A, they're human beings. And I think that there is a critical mass of knowledge that we have accrued both within social science and within philosophy and within literature and within the humanities broadly about human nature, both, you know, as it is and as it could be about both, you know, the kind of descriptive questions of what are the kinds of biases that derail people? What are the kinds of motivations that we see, particularly in certain contexts or, you know, as, moderated by certain personality styles, right? And then we also, I think I've, we've learned a lot, although often across different disciplines that don't talk to each other very well, but I think we also know a lot about what kinds of goal pursuits, what kinds of, what ways of approaching one's life, what kinds of virtues and skills and choices lend themselves to a life that flows really well for the individual who's living it and that tend to actually deepen knowledge versus just kind of send us in uh, in you know wheel spinning circles of 
deluding ourselves or reinforcing our own biases, right? And so I think there's a lot that we know that does universalize, but it really is at the level of broad principles that often have a conditional format to them, right? Like when encountering a you know, belief disconfirming piece of evidence, here's a way of approaching it that will tend to lead you down a better road versus the worse road. Right. And, you know, when doing something really hard and when encountering your own weaknesses, you know, here are different approaches that when people take them tend to lead to these different outcomes and so on. So it's always occurred to me that in an academic setting, that that's not a good environment to train entrepreneurs uh, because <laughs> yes. an academic setting is a safe, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a safe yep, environment yep. and being, being yep. an entrepreneur, starting up a business, that's anything but safe. And, Indeed. and so much of being an entrepreneur is actually uh, the emotional side of business. Um, oh yes. So if, if, if as an example, you need to go and fire the head of marketing who happens to be your college buddy that you you spent the last eight years with, uh, but that's the weakest link in the whole business that you're trying to get off the ground. That That's an yep. emotional thing that's really hard to deal with. Or just watching your own bank account go to zero, that's debilitating for so many people. And that's, that's, that's right. very difficult to teach the emotional side of business in an academic setting. Uh, your that's thoughts right. on that? I feel very... Uh, resonant with what you're saying, because in a way, that's the challenge I've been solving for and why I have sought my own, you know, outside the box, uh, off kilter entrepreneurial ways to actually coach the entrepreneurs in their own native environments, you know, within an incubator that I've been really fortunate to work with entrepreneur first. Um, and, you know, within their actual ventures and in the, if you will, ecologically valid context, to use one of our, you know, academic sure. kind of jargony terms for right. like in the actual world where they're trying to pursue these real ventures that, where there isn't just the, where what's at stake is not, you know, getting paid 20 bucks or getting credit for an experiment in your psychology class, right? Which is ultimately all that's ever at stake in most of our psychological experiments. Right. And I've been thinking about this recently, like, Everything we think we know about human nature from standard academic you know, psychological experiments, we know based on things we've had people do where the stakes are, you get to leave the room in an hour, basically unconditional upon anything you do or say, and <laughs> you get a few bucks and right. or a credit towards your class. Like what, <laughs> you know, how important and how generalizable <laughs> are those findings actually right. going to be right. So, yeah, so I'm very much with you. And I think we have to get outside the academy and we, and with that said, I mean, there are plenty of ways I've learned over time that there are ways to be more or less entrepreneurial about academia and within academia, I, but I don't think that that's what it tends to pull for. And right. I think it takes creativity to figure out how to, do that kind of scientific research in the settings where, you know, where the stakes are high and the emotions run high, as you said. Could you tell us a little bit about your work with founders? I'm familiar with your, your sub stack on it and I've listened to a few of your podcasts, but I don't actually know much about what the day to day of that looks like. Yes, yeah, sure. Well, it's, in a way it's an ever changing uh, experiment, but my work really started in full force when I was fortunate to be in this collaboration with Entrepreneur First, which is uh, a startup accelerator in Europe. It's London-based, though now really international. And its model is somewhat unique in that they focus on helping founders find co-founders. So they okay. bring together cohorts of a mix of really impressive de technical people with you know PhDs in machine learning or in like biotech or in whatever kind of you know, kind of deep technical knowledge would be conducive to doing something really new in the technical space. And then more commercial people who maybe they've already had a successful exit or maybe they're they're really well connected to an industry uh, or whatever the case may be. And they create this eight week pressure cooker where these, you know, where the cohort comes together and people team up and break up really quickly and try to ideate together and actually start validating or 
invalidating hunches for potential business ideas. And as you might imagine, oh, and then at the end, if they've managed to find a co-founder within their cohort after eight weeks and to develop a business idea that they can pitch to EF, which is you know ultimately a VC, right? An investor. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They can pitch it to EF at the end of this sort of trial period. EF then decides to invest in a certain percentage or you know proportion of the companies that form. And then they help the, those companies, which are still pre-seed at that point, they then help them to you know really develop the idea and start to fundraise for a larger seed round, et cetera. And so I came on largely to help them with the emotional uh, dimensions and just the interpersonal dimensions of trying to do all of this in this short period of time. Because you can imagine as scary and difficult as breakups are in the the real world where the timelines are long, right? Imagine you're doing something really, really intense and emotional and important and potentially life-changing together and then after a couple of weeks, you decide, you know what, this isn't working out. We got to break up. Mm-hmm. Right. And you're encouraged to do that. And I think in a way that's a real strength of the program that it's actually destigmatizing breakups. And I think it's just, just such a powerful framework. Right. But it's still so, so hard for right. people to actually lean in and to have those hard conversations and to do it qu- you know, quickly and to be authentic with each other when they've just met they're strangers. And so I've been brought in to help with all of that, (laughs) Um, but also in the process. And it's just been such a rewarding experience for me. I've just gotten to soak in the knowledge of what actually happens in the early days of founding a company and what are all the decisions and what does it mean to, you know, to incorporate and what is, how do you communicate with your investors and what are the things on your mind? You know, when you're first like way before product market fit, like you're just trying to figure out, is there even a problem, you know, to be solved here? And what is our kind of 10 X, you know, um, sort of value proposition and, what is the belief and what is the hunch and what does it look like when we've talked to enough customers and how do we know, right. you know, it, when we should sort of trust the signal. So it's just been a blast for me and a huge learning experience. And I've really started to develop a bunch of hypotheses that now I'm starting to test around sort of what founders need at various stages of this really intense, ambitious, you know, stressful process of creating something new together. Well, that- have you, if you found that uh, kind of this newer generation coming up, I mean, uh, you probably don't have a lot of experience with uh, a lot of the older, the boomers and the Xers, but uh, <laughs> yeah, is this newer generation different in any way uh, in the yeah, way it, they think about it? I mean, it's a great question and I definitely am not qualified to answer it well or in any sort of systematic way. I can, and I can also say that my experience is, particularly confounded by the fact that I've mostly worked with European founders, which are, you know, those are different ecosystems and even across cities in Europe. So I've worked with founders in London, Berlin, and Paris, and a few in Toronto. And those four ecosystems are all different from each other. And they're all really different from Silicon Valley. And in certain ways, they're aspiring to be more like Silicon Valley. And in certain ways, they're trying to really differentiate themselves from Silicon Valley. And there's still this kind of question of who are we going to be and what is going to be the, you know, what are we aspiring for our startup culture to be? And so a lot of it is sort of in flux and it's being figured out. But I would say the generation of European early stage startup founders that I've been working with is probably different in lots of different ways. Partly, I think the, the level of risk aversion versus risk appetite, you know, we're still, EF is is recruiting on risk appetite because we know that you're going to have to have at least some of that in order to even, you know, take a shot, right, at a kind of fast growing uh, VC backed startup. But it's harder to activate that risk appetite, at least in the European ecosystems where, you know, where I've been working, I think partly because of the surrounding culture and because VCs are generally a lot more conservative and and there's just there's less capital to go around and there's a kind of I think self-perpetuating cycle of almost like maybe a little bit of an inferiority complex like we're not Silicon Valley we can't afford these big bets you know and I think there's an effort to break out of that mindset which is part of what's been fun for me is to sort of help push people out of that mindset into it look if not you who if not now when right um that's that's one thing I've noticed. 
What are some of the hypotheses that you're working on with respect to founders and the problems they run into? Because I'm, I'm at an early stage company, Elementus, we're a blockchain analytics company. I'm the director of communications there, but we just hired a head of people. We don't even have a head of marketing yet. So we're just, we're kind of doing all of these things right now. So we've raised money. We're kind of past the founder. We're, we're past the, uh, the incorporation stage and the, the initial, ra- uh, fundraising stages, but it's very much an early company. It's very much a young company. We're navigating all of these waters. So what advice would you have to a company like that? Sure. Yeah. So I think, I mean, I'm going to try to just dip a toe in the water of all the different things I've been thinking about and starting to formulate as advice. But I think some of the big themes I've been converging on, one is kind of what is authenticity, you know, and what does it mean to be, to, to kind of lead with honesty, with transparency, with authenticity? Does it mean that you're constantly focusing on the problems and that you're bringing everybody down? That doesn't seem useful, right? But on the other hand, what's the alternative? Is the alternative to always be painting a kind of rosy picture and keeping the real, you know, all the disasters and the problems to yourself, whether from your co-founder or from the rest of the team, you know, that, in my experience and observation also doesn't bear great fruit, right? It actually makes it harder to build credibility because people pretty quickly come to see that your, you know, rosy predictions don't always come true and that things take longer than you keep saying they will. And then you still seem really confident when actually, you know, the world has sort of moved along and it's already been a year since you said you would raise, you know, these funds and you still haven't, but you're still saying that you're super sure. Right. So what is the kind of, what's the right approach to communication within the company? And I have found that there is a builder's mindset kind of way of approaching that communication where you're a visionary and you're an honest visionary where, you know, there's a reality orientation. There's a kind of, I've just been reading the kind of classic book, good to great, you know, Mm -hmm. where Jim Collins Mm -hmm. and his team studied a bunch of these companies that like exploded and massively grew in their, um, you know, profitability and other companies that started the same and then kind of just languished. And, you know, he talks about this synthesis of facing the brutal facts and quote, never losing faith. I wouldn't necessarily put it that way because I don't think it's about faith. I think it's about conviction. I don't think it's arbitrary, but like there's something that you believe such that, and you believe it with based on a lot of data gathering and a lot of the observation of the world. Right. And, and expertise in your domain over time, such that you're, you still see this as worth doing despite all the uncertainty, despite all the real derailments and other aspects of your model might be changing all the time. And you can hold both of those, right? You can both see the horizon and communicate, right? The, the kind of the brightness of that horizon. And you can be looking around you and keeping an eye on the road and saying, you know, and, and kind of being really transparent about guys, we're probably not going to hit this target or, right. you know, we're going to really have to hustle if we hope to raise even half of what we had originally, uh, you know, kind of promised ourselves or whatever the case may be, or this tech is actually way harder to build, you know, or we thought we had product market fit, but actually, you know, we're getting these signals that tell us we may need to pivot and, and sort of being in that bullpit together and building mutual credibility that, yeah, we can face brutal facts and not lose sight of the larger conviction. So long as, you know, it still remains credible. Can I ask you a follow up to that? So I am, am totally with you with respect to the importance of maintaining a reality orientation and being honest with yourself and with everyone else. This is a basic virtue, but I don't know how to square that with these famous examples of visionaries like Steve Jobs or Elon Musk who have these reality distortion fields or who perpetually overpromise and it doesn't work out, but somehow it still does. Like they don't hit their targets. You know, Musk didn't succeed in building a rocket in six months or whatever he said, but he still, he got it done. And, and I wonder sometimes if maybe those unrealistic expectations push people to work harder than they otherwise would. And so you've got a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy dynamic there. So how do you square that with honesty? Is there just more happening there or do some people just get a pass from reality, I guess? That's a great question. Yeah. So I just interpret those people and their approaches differently. I don't actually think, you know, and I know that there's a whole kind of developed view about the reality distortion fields and, you know, there's in my field of, you know, psychological, especially in the social sciences, there's, this whole, you know, many decades worth of research on how we all supposedly self-deceive all the time. Right. We're calling that that's all based on undergrads sitting in a room for an hour, right. you know, getting paid 20 bucks at the end of it. Or rats. Right. 
or, or rats for that matter, indeed. Um, so my read, for example, so on Musk, and I think that's a great example, you know, whatever else we could say about his antics, you know, on social right. media, whatever, like he actually, he famously doesn't overpromise. Like he'll say things like, like he gave SpaceX a what, 30% shot at eventually succeeding in its mission, maybe, or 10%, not 30, it was 10%. Something, I yeah. get him confused sometimes with, I think Bezos gave Amazon a 30% chance that I, you know, and I'm getting lost in all those statistics now. But I think Musk for both Tesla and SpaceX, when he was getting started and he was open about it and he's, you know, quoted in many interviews and you could hear him saying it like, I don't know, maybe a 10% chance we'll actually manage to send humans to Mars, but that's a chance well worth taking because if we do, then we have now enabled you know, human space travel to Mars. And if we don't, at least we'll have figured out a bunch of ways that don't work and we'll have moved the needle forward because clearly this needs to be happening. Like this is a mission worth pursuing. Right. And I want to be part of that. Right. And, and the thing is like, I think he was more inspiring to more people because he framed it that way and didn't BS, you know, his way through. Oh yeah, no, definitely. We'll send people to Mars in a week right. or in a month or mm -hmm. a year or whatever. Like, no, probably we won't. Like we'll probably fail. And you know what? That's fine. I want to do it anyway. And here's why. Right. And I think Jobs is actually in many ways deeply s similar. Like, I, I think when he promises and, and of course, oftentimes you'll still be off in your predictions. Right. But I think if anything, you know, Jobs is often described as sort of ruthless and as, you know, kind of hard driving. Right. And partly, I think, because he would face the brutal facts and he would kind of call things out for what they are, both in himself and in, you know, his team. And you know, we can argue about whether he always did that in the most tactful way, but I think like he would be the first to say like, guys, we're under, like, we're not hitting our target here. And I think that's part of what made him great. Yeah. So when you, when you talk about solving a problem uh, and that's the goal of most businesses, there, there's also the other side of the equation, which is advancing civilization. And a lot of what Musk is doing is is he's trying to advance civilization. I mean, yeah. we're, we're, uh, maybe you can consider uh, it a big problem that we haven't been able to get to Mars, and that's a problem we're trying to solve. But, yeah, but Well, he but, would say that probably, right? Yeah, right but yeah, I think, but, yes, but you're right, that there's yeah, a yeah, that, more that's, forward that's, looking That's not actually a, a problem that's on a top 10 problem list that we haven't been to Mars <laughs> no. yet. So, <laughs> um, so and, anyway, I, I, I always like to bring that up because – um, there, there is that side of the equation that people aren't just trying to solve uh, problems, that they're actually trying to, uh, the term I use is advancing civilization, but maybe there's a better way of phrasing that. Uh, have you given thought to that? That's really interesting. It, as I'm hearing you say it, I'm thinking, like my first gut reaction is, yeah, I probably am going to think that that's a, first, uh, sorry, a false dichotomy. But Maybe I'm wrong, and let me unpack that a little bit. Because when I think about, A, what what even counts as a problem worth solving? Whatever counts as a problem worth solving? How do we decide what problems are we solving? And, and then, you know, if we take it from the other angle, like, what does advancing civilization mean? Advancing toward what? And both of them seem to converge on the same point, which is our problem is how to not go extinct at the end of the day and right. how to, you know, like right. how to thrive and flourish and, you know, cure the diseases that will, or, or vaccinate ourselves against the diseases that will otherwise wipe us out and shorten our lifespans. And all of the innovation and all of the progress that humanity has achieved has been in service of that aim fundamentally, right? Like, what does it mean to advance? Like, being able to read and write and to build skyscrapers and to create advanced medical technology it all ser ultimately it serves the aim of improving the human condition of either making us more resilient against threats or allowing us to make better use of the time that we have or allowing us the you know the kind of the concentration of resources to be able to do something that's actually going to be more ambitious and long range that then will help but will help free us from some of the threats are just, you know, the kind of daily grind that makes it hard for us to fully leverage our creative capacities, right? Like it's all in service of solving the problem of human life and flourishing. So I, right, guess right. I think they're just at different levels of, of abstraction. Yeah, that's maybe. a great answer. Thank you for that. And, and I think it's worthwhile pointing out that just business in general moves civilization forward. I mean, it's not always that grandiose if, if you're 
running a dry goods store, you're probably not waking up every day thinking that you're advancing civilization. But I mean, there's an important sense in which you are like civilization. Yeah. The edifice of civilization is made from those bricks. It's not all SpaceX and Blue Origin. Right. And, and there's nothing wrong yeah. with just running a small town grocery store or something like that and just and doing a damn good job of it and being happy at the end of the day. Beautifully put, or for that matter, just being a grocer, being a customer service person, right? Or like being the clerk at the grocery store. My life is enhanced by the really excellent grocery clerks and by the really excellent, you know, the people who actually are like attentive or the, and the actually greeters, noticing the, my needs. The, the greeters who really yes. like their job or the TSA agents who are really happy to be there and just like mix it up with, every, <laughs> with everybody going through the yeah, line. What a like, rare and precious gift. <laughs> right? like, thank yeah. you for loving your job. Like, the, like this whole experience has been so much better. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I was just at a restaurant today and it's this high end restaurant in New York city, you know, per se, but my partner and I who were enjoying this incredible meal and were being waited on so just beautifully, just eloquently and thoughtfully. And just, and we were talking about how, wow, like the people who are working at, at this restaurant, like they love their jobs and they excel at their jobs. And like, we were reveling in their excellence, you know, mm -hmm. and we were talking about how, like how much you know, honor and nobility there is in doing a job like this really well. And how many people we know, including PhDs and academics and academic dropouts, like they don't experience their lives in the kind of way that these excellent wait staff do. And I really mean that like all the way down that there's, you know, they are absolutely advancing human civilization. They've advanced my life today and they've, you know, hopefully, and I think they're modeling what it looks like to live well, the very least in what they're bringing with them to work every day. Yeah. What Ayn Rand said in Atlas Shrugged, there are no lousy jobs, just lousy men that don't want to do them. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I think that's basically the insight. Why don't you tell us a little bit about building the builders? Sure. So so the concept evolved out of some of the work I've been doing with startup founders, but also this progress movement that I've been mm -hmm. you know, paying some attention to and noticing how it arose largely out of the pandemic and the ways that we weren't ready for the pandemic, right? And sort of observations around the fact that we're, we haven't really been advancing human civilization very aggressively. Nope. And that's catching up to us in a big way mm -hmm. with the problems that we're encountering where we can't seem to make enough tests quickly enough, right? Like every aspect of the sort of the manufacturing pipeline and every aspect of, even though the scientists, they did their part, they right. figured out, you know, the basic uh, uh, mRNA technology, like in an insanely fast, right? Like a few weeks it mm -hmm. took them basically right from when they started working on the problem and then to actually move through the whole pipeline and to meanwhile, you know, just give enough people access to just basic necessities, right? And like get enough masks out there, get enough uh, you know, per, per, of PPA out there, right? Get enough hospital beds. Like we were just gross. I mean, it felt like living in a developing country as someone who's from one. Right. And We'll we'll bracket the question of what's happening to my poor country at this moment, right? right? But it felt like being in a developing country, and and then it was a breath of fresh air to read these kinds of calls to action by people like Mark Andreessen, who mm -hmm. wrote that kind of you know very it's quickly went viral. It's time to build mm -hmm. peace, right? And then from there, th there were echoes of that sentiment in a lot of other you know, work that was done within the progress studies movement, the whole rise of the progress studies movement, but also you know, the idea of an abundance agenda. And it became this bipartisan mm -hmm. kind of call, right, to, to action and a call to forward thinking and very much this recognition that, look, this is how we face down threats. This is how we don't go extinct, is actually by being creative, by making things, by making things better, by creating new technology, by solving problems using our intellect. And so as I was hearing all that and as I was working with founders, you know, within the F and elsewhere, the, the, the themes started to converge for me. And I realized, okay, well, what I'm trying to do is build the builders, right? right. That's my contribution to all this. If I'm going to have one is that, you know, I'm interested in, well, what is it that actually motivates and inspires and guides people through the work of building? Cause it's really hard, right? Part of the reason we haven't been building is we're depressed and anxious and we don't have the confidence to go out and try something new and right. we feel, you know, and we're risk averse and we're being 
told that it's not noble, you know, that, that there are these other ways to contribute to society that don't involve building and that, you know, we should go into the public sector or mm -hmm. that you know, we're just getting all these mixed messages and, you know, never mind our education sucks. And that makes it even harder to think about anything clearly because we don't know very much for them when we grow up. <laughs> and we're sort yeah. of trying to navigate this world where psychologically there's a lot of roadblocks in our way. And so that's what I'm trying to help with is just clearing some of those psychological roadblocks and so, building up some of the psychological strength. So, so one of the big problems is that Hollywood has painted an unrealistic picture of, um, I mean, I mean, in the movies and the television shows, it's always Jeff Goldblum comes in, and in about 15 <laughs> minutes, he's solved the problem. And yeah. Jeff finds and, a way. Yeah, <laughs> and then we, we get frustrated because it takes us two weeks to solve the problem, but he does it in 15 minutes. And, right. and so <laughs> we then uh, consider ourselves a failure because we, we couldn't act that fast. Um, yeah, are, are we living in a distorted world because of some of the things like that we have these unrealistic pictures of what things actually look like in real life yeah i mean i one of the core interventions that i have found myself implementing is just purely kind of resetting expectations and normalizing the struggle right and i think it's true that there are lots of these portrayals in hollywood and social media elsewhere of just like, oh, it's, you know, it's easy and it's quick. And these people never had any doubt and they just sort of went and they did it. And voila, you know, one day they're working out of their basement, the next day they're Bill Gates or whatever it may be. But in fact, if you dig a little bit, there are also all kinds of accounts of how much they failed and how much right. they struggled and mm -hmm. how many times, you know, Steve Jobs getting fired from his own company and having multiple existential crises, even when he was really successful. And, you know, Ben Horowitz, one of the books that really inspired me when getting started with all this was uh, The Hard Thing About Hard Things by Ben Horowitz, where right. he describes the struggle, capital T, capital S, that every founder has to go through in order to get to greatness, according to him, at least. And I think there's a lot to it. And it, it sounds a whole lot like severe depression in parts, you know, just the, like you feel completely ashamed of ever having dragged anybody into this with you. And <laughs> you just you like you can't understand you, you can't tell anyone else why you started. And frankly, you can't really even remember yourself why on earth you ever thought this was a good idea. And you're tearing your hair out, you know, and you wish you could get away on vacation for a week. But, you know, that wouldn't solve anything because you would just end up crying over your failing startup the whole time. And there's just there's no escape. There's no like. That's it. That's the struggle. And mm -hmm. he goes on. There's like pages of description of the struggle. And he says, every great founder has endured the struggle. The difference between the great founders and the, everybody else is that they've endured and that they've gotten to the other side. And there are lots of examples like that. But it's sort of like if you've got to dig for them. You've got to find them. And I think there's a mindset that that makes those examples stand out more and be more salient. Right. There's a kind of growth mindset around what it takes to build something hard, that it's not the default, right? That the default is failure, that the mm -hmm. default is the status quo. And you're trying to break the default. You're trying to push against the default. That's really hard. Right, <laughs> you're right. going to fail a bunch and it's messy and it's iterative. And I think just painting a picture of that reality is a huge part of the work of, you know, building builders. That's fantastic. Um, I wanted to ask you a sort of follow up to that. It, it's it's about how great founders are able to think from first principles. And I pulled this from your chat with Tal Um People oh, cool. like uh, Jeff you Bezos. And, yeah, yeah, I did. I and, and read two of your papers, um, oh, which which perhaps we'll get time to to talk about. Um, yeah, people like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos are famously able to get to the heart of the matter, uh, to sort of discard the assumptions that have accreted around a set of problems in a field and to reconsider it from just the basics. And it sounds sort of simple when you describe it that way, but as anyone who's ever tried knows, it's actually pretty difficult to do. So yeah. does that just come from a, a independence or confidence, or is that a learnable skill? And if so, what are the, what are the aspects of acquiring it? It's a really good question. So I don't, when I embarked on a kind of study of first principles, I didn't really know the answer to that question at all. In fact, I had a bunch of wrong answers to that question because what I observed was a bunch of my founder friends and she's like people I really admire who are building stuff. They, they 
talk about first principles all the time. They right. just keep saying it like it's just like, well, we're we're approaching it from first principles. We're building for, and I it sounds like this vaguely good thing to me, but I don't actually understand what they mean. Right. And so at some point, I did a deep dive. Like, where does this term come from? What is it, like? How is it different from just like? being rational or being principled or being independent, which it kind of seemed like vaguely it was gesturing at those things. And it took a few iterations for me to, I think, kind of get to the essence of it. And I think the essence is actually yeah, like, yes, you have to think independently. Like, yes, a lot of these other things are true, but I think the essence of it is to go deep. Okay. Believe it or not. The essence of it is to not only, you know, ask yourself questions that kind of lead you to re-examine your assumptions afresh, but try to describe what you know in a way that that captures and explains as wide a range of the different things that you've observed and that you know as possible. And you could do that in different dimensions. You could do it in time. Like, so the Jeff Bezos example is, what is gonna still be true for our customers 10 years from now, 20 years from now? Like they're always gonna want stuff that's cheaper. They're always gonna want stuff that's good and stuff that gets there fast, right? Like we know those things and we know we need customers. Like we'll never not need customers. The nature of the business we are. Whereas like technology comes and goes and competitors come and go and there are all these other factors. But like one thing that's eternal that I can count on as a principle through thick and thin, through a bunch of the different changes that might happen that I can't foresee is, we need happy customers and customers are going to want, you know, all else being equal, things to be cheaper, things to be better quality, things to be faster, right? Let's really just make those our North Stars, right? Like our North Stars customer obsession, that's it. And we're not going to get distracted by whatever, all this other stuff that might seem shiny in the moment, but like long-term, it's not actually going to achieve our fundamental aim, which is happy customers. That's how we're going to profit. That's how we're going to grow happy customers. And, and so it's, sort of seeing through a bunch of the details, a bunch of the particulars, a bunch of the changing times to the thing that's sort of universal and going to stay true. And similarly, you know, it's seeing to the essence of like, so the, you know, the famous Musk example that he uses himself when talking about first principles is like when he rethought the question of how much is a rocket, basically, like what should it cost? Because at first he was just going to pay somebody to send a rocket to Mars, right? He just wanted somebody to do it. So he's going to go buy a rocket and have somebody, you know, <laughs> pilot it. I don't know. Go to Home Depot, just, I guess. As just, one does. You know, six months, rockets. whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Go to Home Yeah, exactly. No, but but legitimately, he wanted to know, okay, well, what did rockets go for on the market? Like, you know, Home Depot or elsewhere? Like, who sells them? How much are they? And he got quoted these ridiculous absorb exorbitant rates of like tens of millions of dollars per rocket. And he... And most people would just stop there. Like, okay, well, that's a fact of the world. These rockets are hugely expensive. I, you know, no wonder that there's no privately, you know, funded space flight. This is like only the government can afford this. So I'm going to walk away from it. But he started asking himself sort of f- deeper questions about like, what is the nature of a rocket? It's a, f- it's a mechanic. It's a large mechanical object. It's made of stuff. It's made of materials. It takes some amount of effort to assemble. But like that effort can't possibly create the bottleneck on how much it costs to build because there's only so much manpower that you can, you know, like that can't be kind of what's creating the ceiling on the cost. Like the bulk of the cost of any large mechanical object by the nature of things (laughs) should be the materials that it's made of. (laughs) Right. So how much are the materials? And he went and he looked it up, like just the raw materials on the commodities market, you know, carbon this and titanium that, I don't know, aluminum, whatever. And it was like 2%. It, it all, like when he added up all the materials that go to making a rocket, it was 2% of the current going price. And he just was like, this makes no sense. This is not necessary. It should not cost this much. So he decided to build SpaceX and just do it from scratch. Right. And I think the reason that that's an example of first principles thinking is he's applying the deepest level of his, like, he's asking about the nature of stuff. Right. And he's applying it to this particular problem. And so he's thinking at a deep level about like, what is what are the fundamental truths that are applicable in this situation that can guide me in understanding in a really fresh way that nobody has really thought through before how to actually solve this problem he's distinguishing between the metaphysical and the man-made kind of yeah in this case but i think the the even deeper thing that we're doing when we're thinking first principles is we're kind of going to the fundamentals we're like going to the like 
we're we're applying we're either generating or applying really kind of deep broad fundamental knowledge about whatever the domain that we're thinking about to guide us in making our you know kind of particular decisions and choices so another example would be yeah you know, my partner matt he runs he works you know on the executive team of a company that starts schools mm -hmm. and like they have a first principle which is an identification of of what it takes for human beings in effect to kind of develop to their full potential right. that there's a certain combination of unlocking their agency plus applying a certain kind of structure and that if you can put those things together that if you can create a structure that activates agency then <coughs> you're going to unlock kind of the full human potential and that's it and you know part of what i think characterizes the first principle is like it sounds fairly simple when you say right it's like it's a short statement but that packs in a ton of knowledge and a ton of different possible applications and ways that that could look and can guide you through a whole, you know, it can guide you th with toddlers and with teenagers. It can guide you through math and through science and through English and through PE, right? Like it applies to a whole bunch of different contexts where, you know, where the particular decisions are going to look very different, but you can still be applying the same sort of overarching lens, if that makes sense. Right. There's a, a technique that um, in the futurist realm called backcasting. Now, backcasting is where you, you start with a preferable future, um, six, eight, yeah. ten, ten years in the future, and then you work backwards from there and, uh, and, and talk about how you get get to that point. And Amazon is a company that has um, really become... Uh, quite excellent in doing the backcasting because when mm -hmm. they when they want to introduce a new product or a new service they start from the end uh, the first thing yeah. they'll do is they'll write the press release on that uh, and yep and then uh, because that's that's usually the last thing you do how how are you going to actually uh, tra awesome. translate this into something that potential customers or the general public will understand. So how do you create a press release? And after they get that right, then they work backwards to uh, frequently asked questions, um, FAQs uh, that you'd put on a website. So uh, I, I find that to be such a such a brilliant strategy for for moving things forward. And I, I see well, that I see that in, in lots of the startups that were um, making headlines in the newspapers right now um, because they're not afraid of, of envisioning what the future is going to look like. Um, so yeah. it, is, is that part of the equation of what you're looking at as well? Absolutely. I love that concept of backcasting. And yeah, I think being able to articulate a bold, credible vision of sort of like where the world is going, what does the future look like? Right. And thinking about Peter Thiel's zero to one concept and, you know, he also talks about first principles from a slightly different angle. Right. He talks about the important truths that most people disagree with you about. Right. Like what is something you believe that is importantly true and that's importantly non-consensus and right. <laughs> right. I think that's the, the wording he uses. And I think being able to generate that belief about the end state right that you're aiming at about the different future that you're striving toward and about what is in principle possible i think this is also what kind of connects up that theme of first principles to right it's like it is in principle possible for us to figure out how to modify the genome so that we eliminate certain diseases we don't know how we're going to do it we don't know how long it's going to take to do it but like we understand enough about the biology that like we know that it is in principle possible so we should be trying to do it and we should be leveraging all of our resources and we should be iterating and experimenting and you know we should be getting people inspired and mobilized to work on it right and we should be writing the press release absolutely right because we want to really formulate like we want to be able to see the horizon and the better we see it the better we can navigate all the different you know curveballs and unexpected ravines and and jungles that we find along the way because at least like we know our destination mm -hmm. and i yeah that's a real source of sort of insight and uh, so, conviction so, so one of the things i i spent some time doing working on in the past was the this whole concept of the anatomy of a startup 
in when you when you kind of dissect uh, a startup into the uh, different component pieces, uh, you have different uh, different uh, layers that are moving forward at different paces. Um, you, you'll have a legal element, you'll have a financial element, you'll have the, the product development, uh, and, and you'll have the, the human capital part of it. And, and all of these things are advancing in different stages. And kind of knowing where you're at at any given moment, I think, is hugely valuable. Um, so so that's, that was one of my half-baked ideas that I only got – partway down the path of getting it completed, but I, th I still think it has value in a way that uh, to think about the startups in the future. I agree. That sounds very right to me. And, and I'm still learning myself about all the moving parts and, you know, what are the stable patterns and what are just going to be the variable uh, differences across startups, right? It, I imagine you probably know more than I do about what you can expect to see being out of sync and what you can expect syncing up across different startups, at least within a domain. But I guess kind of broadly, as I learn more about it, part of my job as I've seen it is to help founders learn more about it because they don't know either when they're getting started, right? How, like when, when is the legal piece going to become the main overriding concern and when is it going to be, you know, and not only that, but a bunch of these moving parts have to move simultaneously and I can't be the one directly moving them all. So how do I own the work without actually directly, you know, making all the decisions, especially as a company starts to scale. And I have found that that's one of the differentiating challenges of a founder is can they own the scaling of themselves and of the culture, right. And of the kind of decision-making processes and the kind of the broad vision in a way that allows them to step back from all the kind of, you know, each of the particular day-to-day -day operations that's happening at different paces where they're just, they can't be in charge of every decision, but still maintain their accountability of, you know, I think a big part of it just comes down to the relationships and the communication that you establish. Like, you've got to come to me if this isn't working or, you know, like what are the kind of the failure conditions where I need to get involved or where you need to kind of keep me apprised and how are you keeping your team accountable and how am I ensuring that you're doing that and that all of our different, you know, sort of managers and team leads are doing that. And what are the conversations I need to have when that doesn't seem to be happening? Right. So I think just a big part of the job becomes the kind of meta management of human resources, right. And everything that comes with that. Yeah. So one of the key questions, I guess, if you're running a blockchain business, should you actually be using blockchain to keep, track of the blockchain <laughs> business <laughs> that yeah, a, is that's that a jab a at me that, <laughs> well, that is above my pay grade right there we, we use excel for everything it's, but it's on the blockchain it's a, a block excel uh yeah i, I want to turn to some of your your academic work because if we don't do it now we won't have time for it so in your sure. paper nurturing our better nature a proposal for cognitive integrity is a foundation for autonomous living you make the case that nurture is important and nature is important but these are not the only two factors determining a person's character and ultimate success what's missing from the standard account in your view yeah i mean in short choice i think is missing but you know there's a lot more right. to say about that <laughs> obviously i think next there's, question <laughs> next question <laughs> choice. Yeah, um, oh yes wash my hands with this one drop <laughs> microphone but i mean i think what's cool kind of what we get from the behavior genetic research and and models of human personality traits you know human behavior is that there's all of this unexplained variance that there's the for all of our talk about how ah you know ge genetics and uh, and biological science is going to explain away our free will it's going to explain away everything right. and we're just going to be you know cogs of the great evolutionary machine or whatever it's not coming anywhere close to explaining everything and in fact systematically we see that over and over and over again we get up to for most human personality traits complex behaviors you know characteristics we end up in roughly this 40 to 50 percent heritability range so like about you know half or a little less than half of the variability in this behavior you know whatever it, whether it's an extroversion or depression or the tendency to moralize or religiosity or 
or SES or, or um, even intelligence, you know, you name it, things that we think of as like being really, really heritable or a little bit heritable. Most of them by and large with some, you know, obviously error bars and also some interesting variability based on the environment and the context, mm -hmm. they all kind of fall in this 40, 50% heritable range. And so then what's the remaining 50? Well, you think maybe it's your shared environment, meaning like the home you grew up in. And, you know, these are largely twin studies on which these numbers are based. So like fraternal twins are being compared to identical twins. And so you get an estimate that's just the part that's explained by being an identical rather than a fraternal twin. So that's the gene genetic part. And then you get this part that's just being a twin versus not at all a twin. So like just being raised together in the same home versus not. And what we see is, only a tiny bit of further variance is explained by growing up in the same home. And then the rest, the remaining 50-ish percent of the variance is just unexplained variance. It can't be explained away by genes. It can't be explained away by your shared environment. It's like, what is that? And behavior geneticists have debated it and they have you know, different levels of sort of pessimism or optimism about maybe we can still explain it away or maybe we can't. You know, And then here and there, you've got these voices, including one who was a professor of mine, who I really admired, Eric Turkheimer, who got me started down this whole path, who said, there's nothing pessimistic about this. This is human volition. This is choice. This is free will. This is <laughs> the fact that we can actually self-determine. Why would we want to get rid of this 50%? Right. <laughs> and that was sort of the inspiration for kind of going down that particular road was thinking, how do we actually leverage the choices we have and how do our choices interact with our environment and our genes, given that obviously those matter, right? Right. Those are not irrelevant, but like what choices do we have over what we do with them and how we, you know, modify them and let them shape us over time. Are you saying it's aliens? I, I definitely heard. <laughs> That's what I heard. That's there. what I heard. Yeah. There was definitely <laughs> aliens there somewhere. <laughs> they, they think about aliens? Is there like a subliminal message? Maybe that yeah. Through? That's going in the title. That's going in the title. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, that would be another fun explanation. <laughs> yeah. That would be a lot of fun. So what is the yeah. cognitive integrity in the, in the paper title? Cognitive integrity is a foundation for autonomous living. What is that? Yeah, sure. So, you know, it, it's what we were talking about earlier under the general heading of being honest with ourselves. Um, it's a slightly more jargony term for that general commitment, <laughs> um, but with an understanding of how that, what I call kind of metacognitive mode. So metacognitive meaning like how we think about our thinking or how do we direct our own thinking, right? It's the identification that there are different ways we can direct our thinking and that that's in my view one of the most basic choices that we have that never fully goes away for most of us we can choose to a to direct our thinking or to just kind of be on autopilot it's the ba and we can basic that. locus of free will yeah i think it's as close as we get to a locus of free will that we can we can a decide like i'm going to pay attention to this podcast or i'm going to think about what i'm going to have for dinner or I'm going to just let my mind wander or, you know, you, so, so we can kind of choose in particular, we can literally like we can control the lever on our attention, at least when we're thinking about it. Right. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we'll forget and we'll have lapses and I have lapses all the time. And when I'm on ADHD medication, I have fewer of them than when I'm <laughs> off of it. So this definitely is not to say like, it's just 100% just like, you know, pure a contextual choice. Like there are plenty of other factors, but when we become aware or when we're kind of able to, turn on that kind of metacognitive you know, insight into our own conscious goings on, right? Some choices present themselves, right? Including particular choices of like, what do I want to think about? Where do I want to pay attention? But also what I see as the kind of even more meta choice of like, do I want to actually be trying to understand and to know and to like engage with the world? Or do I want to be kind of posturing at that? Do I want to be going through the motions of that, of like pretending to myself that I'm trying to figure it out when really I'm just trying to make myself feel better, right? Or pretending to myself that I am trying to really understand why I overslept this interview so that then, you know, I can be really confident that I did my best and that I'm not missing anything when really I'm just trying to rationalize why I did it. So then I don't have to go through the pain of like trying to reschedule it and potentially being embarrassed and still not getting the job, which would hurt a lot, even though like clearly actually that would be my better path to try to do. So, so basically that's the distinction. So the cognitive integrity is consciously choosing and valuing the choice of the first over the second of like, I actually really want to engage 
rather than just pretend to. Is, is there a principled way to learn how to tell the difference? Because I find from for myself over many years of trying to maintain a reality orientation, I can kind of tell when I'm confabulating nonsense, like phenomenologically, it feels different. And I can just say that's bullshit. Like yeah. I, I'm, I'm just presenting excuses for something I wanted to do anyway, but I don't know yep. if, if there's a way to bootstrap that. If, if a person's not in that habit, how, how do you build uh, a, a habit towards cognitive integrity? Yeah. I mean, that's been one of the big areas of work that I've been involved in. So I'm happy, you know, I could talk about that for the whole podcast. Don't let me do that, but I could. Um, I've <laughs> Hour written number a piece two. called, er, er, yes, um, there, I've written in, so if anyone wants just like some of my kind of quick and dirty strategies, I wrote a piece in psychology today called uh, five steps to earning your own trust. I was told that if you put it in steps, then more people will read it. So okay. I gave that format a try. Fun five stuff. steps. Yeah, <laughs> It's very straightforward, you know, boom, boom, boom. But to actually, you know, to at least preview it, the answer a little bit, there's a bunch of ways. So if we think about how we, how we learn to tell when other people are being disingenuous with us, right? It's like, we all know what it's like to kind of ha- like, you know, do a sniff test for like, is this person BSing us? Is this person being defensive? Is this person, you know, sort of like this person isn't really answering the question we asked. And like, it's different the way they're answering this question than if I, than if there wasn't a personal stake in it, but they're pretending like there's no personal stake in it. We can apply a lot of the same tools to ourselves, right? And we actually have a lot more data to work with because like we live in our own heads. So we know what's in there. If we, we are attend us. to it, right? We literally are us. Yeah. <laughs> and in some ways that actually makes it harder, ironically, because it's harder to be objective about ourselves, right? It's often easier to see it in others than in ourselves, but it's not because we don't have the raw material. It's because there's real skill involved in learning to kind of observe ourselves and listen to ourselves from the kind of objective standpoint that, you know, we naturally are able to do with others. So things like, you know, what you're describing, I think can be actually broken down and we can notice like what are particular things about which we tend to BS ourselves. And often, you know, the most promising candidates to look for are like the things where our identity is really wrapped up in them. Right. So like one strategy that I sometimes use is, okay, list your sacred cows, like list the things that if they were not true, you wouldn't even be able to entertain that they're not true. Like, never mind if they are. Like, let's suppose they're true, but like where your whole identity seems to hang on them being true. Just like list them out. Like, I'm good at psychology. For me, that would be one. Like, oh my God. Like, if I learned that I actually suck at this, oof. Right. Like, that would be a tough one, right? To grapple with. And so things that might even remotely initially suggest some possibility that maybe I suck at psychology or I suck at therapy, like, I'm going to tend to want to push those away, rationalize them away, come up with some reason why they're not really evidence for that, why it was really just a fluke or it was the other person's fault or whatever. So like, okay, I should watch for that. Right. Okay. I am in love with my spouse. Like that's a common one. Right. I made the right choice in having a kid. You know, like I actually want to be a parent, <laughs> right. right? Like write those out. Right. So that when you, so like, and then really think about, okay, if this were false, And maybe you're like so completely sure, actually, based on real, you know, accumulated evidence that like you can't really be shaken in it. But like usually the things you write on this list are like, ooh, you know, you could kind of at least imagine getting feeling a little bit threatened about them. And so you so it's worth asking the question like, okay, like if these were false, what would actually be more in my best interest here? Like what would I actually right? Or if there were some shakiness in that, like if I weren't as good at therapy as I thought I was. Like, what would actually be best? Like, would I want to know that or, or would I want to not? <laughs> right. And then like really thinking, thinking, what's the worst case scenario there? Like that I actually have a lot more work to do than I thought and that it's actually a lot harder than I thought, which like, huh, that sounds plausible now that I mention it. And like, you know, maybe we're all imposters because none of us really know what we're doing. And it's just the beginning of this field where we're all kind of, you know, making stuff up and doing a lot of guesswork and like, in certain ways that would be really exciting and I would probably be able to build better credibility with my clients if I could really own that and if I could actually you know be more vigilant for some of the things that I don't know and that I'm constantly trying to improve right so that's a big way it's just like name the sacred cows and like kill the sacred cows (laughs) in terms of like having this be true is not more important to me than 
knowing what's actually true, right? right. Like that is the one fundamental commitment that I can't negotiate or compromise on. Cause as soon as that's out the window, none of this other stuff is real. So that's, that's one strategy. Well, fantastic. Um, I don't think we're going to have time to get to agency via awareness. We'll have to reserve that for another, uh, another podcast, but actually I, that's one of my pet theories in psychology is that attention is poorly understood and underlies a lot of other things. Like I, I've long suspected that when we look at super talented people, what we're actually detecting is not genius, although that can be a part of it, but an obsessive focus. Cause you, you find that as a very common trait across people who super excel in things. They, they can't stop themselves from thinking about it. And I figure if you just took a relatively normal person and made them obsessed with physics and they just couldn't stop thinking about it, no matter what, would they be <laughs> Newton? No, they wouldn't be Newton, but I bet you they'd be pretty impressive by the end of it. Yeah. But having I've, set I've, all that I've, up. Yeah. I've, I've always said that obsession is underrated. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm with you on that. Having yeah, said all that, and out. although, <laughs> yeah, no, having said all that, and I won't take long because I know we're at the end of our hour, but I think you'd find that the hard part is figuring out well, what actually motivates that obsessive focus to begin with, right? And then you get a whole unraveling, yeah, oh, question. You have, to, you have to be logical about it, really. Oh, I don't want thread. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> What a downer. <laughs> Take it up with metaphysics. What? Take it up with metaphysics. Uh, is, there, is there anything you want to leave us with? Ooh. Um, yeah, what gives you hope? That, that was a popular one back in the day. Now I do, what do you want to leave us with? But back in the day I did, what, what makes you hopeful? So, yeah, let's, let's oh, default. Like that. That'll be an easier one. <laughs> what gives you hope? When people genuinely celebrate each other's achievements and like mean it I think oh, that that's gives a great me hope. One. when i just you know even like on twitter when i see that, people just genuinely really, really undefensively yeah. you know just like being really happy for someone else's achievement just like sharing the tweet about how somebody did something awesome you know that that always gives me hope that's that's one of my favorite answers to that question so far yeah. Hall, Hall of Fame for Hope, the Hope Hall of Fame. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Gordon, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for a great conversation.